Hey everyone, Budinsky here. Welcome to the first episode of In Focus. This series takes a closer look at a subject or event which received a lot of attention in the Awaken Wear New Zealand community. Our first episode looks at the homeless in New Zealand, how we got here, and some possible solutions to consider. So hold tight as we attempt to put this story in focus. Over the last few weeks, more and more information is coming out about New Zealand's homeless problem. Reports of families living in cars or in overcrowded circumstances have hit the mainstream media, prompting politicians to scurry for excuses and straw men to divert the public outcry. Minister for Social Housing Paula Bennett is in damage control mode after misinforming the Prime Minister about which services were making contact with the destitute families, while at the same time coming out with some downright ridiculous solutions. The Ministry's proposed solutions so far have included using motel rooms as temporary accommodation, paying the homeless to leave town. Just assume that charity organisations such as the Salvation Army will provide solutions, and my personal favourite, they don't want help. So what is the real reason we're in this situation? New Zealand is a welfare state. It has a proud history of providing social housing and services to its population, and once had a large stock of state housing to provide for Kiwi families. So why are families living in cars? New Zealand is in the middle of a housing crisis. Real estate prices are at record levels, with the medium selling price now over 495000 Annual growth is 4.2%, and in Auckland that rise is 14%. Median rents for a three-bedroom house is now over $400 per week. While some of this growth is fueled by speculation, the truth is more likely a supply versus demand situation, as I'll explain in my next point. Population growth through migration is also pushing up the demand for housing, especially in the main centres. New Zealand currently accepts up to 70,000 migrants per year, and most of those are in the 20 to 35 age group. One of New Zealand's largest immigration demographics is students and young families. These are, of course, the same demographics that are feeling the squeeze. Families with young children, first home buyers, and graduates with debt. The influx of immigrants and foreign students looking for work puts pressure on those already struggling. Adding to these complex issues, we also have the problem of the government selling its housing stock and attempting to shovel this responsibility onto charities and NGOs. Successive governments have slowly reduced state housing stock while also removing barriers for investors and foreign buyers. Again putting the squeeze on the entry level as investors are preferred because of their access to capital and willingness to pay over market value for a longer term payoff. Which brings us to the next point. New Zealand is up for sale. Assets, government contracts, education, land for developers, it's all out there to the highest bidder. One could argue that this is just free market capitalism. However, these policies favour foreign investment over the existing need every time. The government's desperate sell-off of assets and stock lost New Zealand millions of dollars, while investors scooped up bargains at our expense. Even now, most of the land being made available to ease New Zealand's housing market ends up in the hands of developers looking for maximum return, which in turn only exacerbates the problem. Don't expect the real estate industry to have sympathy either. The industry simply circles its wagons to ensure the market continues to be attractive to investors. New bank LVR rates are again being announced and the deposit required to secure a mortgage will again increase which will further strangle lower-income Kiwis from entering the housing market. National Party MPs are reluctant to intervene, of course, claiming that things have never been better. Technically, they're not wrong, because most of them personally benefit from the continued record-setting return on property investment. As you can see, there are many influencing factors involved in just the housing problem alone. Sadly, the biggest problem is government itself. Shortly after World War II, New Zealand was building 10,000 state houses per year. Whole suburbs were erected, and by the 1950s, state tenants were offered loans to buy their homes. 
This building boom brought prices down across the market. This ensured almost a whole generation had the opportunity to own their own homes. In 1974, a housing court was established and focus was placed more on inner city building, unsuitable for families. By the 1990s, National began its attack on social housing, reducing stock and limiting construction. Wealthier recipients were expected to pay market rent until 1999 when the Labour government reinstated income-related rent. Today the government is again selling down stock at a time where it should be building faster than ever before. Real estate has never been more valuable, and by valuable I mean as a family home, not as an asset on an MP's portfolio. Finally, the cutting of funding for social services, particularly mental health services, is the twisting of the blade. A large percentage of the homeless suffer mental health problems, and during times of economic hardship, such as the 2008 global financial crisis, in the following years of austerity budgets, these problems increased greatly. The need for emergency accommodation and respite beds overwhelm underfunded NGOs who then have to make the heartbreaking decision of turning people away. So the homeless problem is far more complex than it may seem on the surface. The crisis extends beyond just a supply versus demand equation. Government policy, immigration, foreign investment, access to credit, and struggling social services all combine to contribute to the problem of homelessness. If the government continues to free up land for development that does not result in low-cost housing, then the problem will only get worse. Each new development at the higher end of the market only pushes average prices higher and further out of reach, playing into the hands of foreign investors who have the benefit of stronger currencies and access to cheap money. Equally, relying on social services and charities while at the same time cutting their funding, shows that this government is oblivious to the failings of its ideology. National's corporate approach is predictably resulting in corporate outcomes, in this case, the externalization of social problems. Charity organizations like the Salvation Army and City Mission are overflowing with needy Kiwis, and our current government is heaping on the pressure to take up the slack of its own shortcomings. So where does this leave us? Unsurprisingly, it leaves us in a very difficult situation. The only real solution to the housing crisis is to replicate the programs of the past which saw the building of low-cost housing to drag down market prices. For this to work, however, there also needs to be access to cheap loans for people to purchase those homes. We also require adequately funded social services to make sure that housing is provided to those in need. That simply cannot happen when average rents are $400 to $450 per week. I'm not sure even a change in government is going to help solve this problem. If a Labour government is elected in 2017, what plan do they have to cool down house prices? How do they plan to produce the number of houses required, not only to house those in need, but to adequately affect the supply of affordable housing to bring market rents down? This is a question all left voters should be asking. In the meantime, the best thing I can think of is to support the charities and services that we know are doing all they can to help. The Salvation Army helps 120,000 Kiwis a year with food parcels, budgeting, and over 131,000 bed nights of accommodation. The Auckland City Mission conducted 298 emergency housing assessments for the homeless last year, as well as 6,500 doctor consultations for the vulnerable. These and other services like them are the real heroes here, but they desperately need and deserve our support. I'll put links below to some of the charities and services providing support to the homeless, and I encourage everyone to donate, volunteer, or even just write a note of support. Many people working in these organisations are volunteers who give themselves tirelessly every day to help others in need. So what do you guys think of this situation? Do you agree with these sentiments? What potential solutions do you see on the issue of homelessness in New Zealand? Let us know in the comments if you have ever experienced homelessness and what barriers did you face. I hope you enjoyed this first episode of In Focus as much as I enjoyed making it. If you did, then consider hitting the like button as it really helps the channel. In Focus will be back next month with a brand new topic to delve into. Until then, stay awake and aware New Zealand. Peace.